There was a rainstorm in Chicago last week that was so powerful, so much rain that the gutters of my house overflowed. They couldn't take the water. It got me thinking about Noah and the story of the flood in the Bible. In fact, I felt a little bit like Noah in the flood. Stay with me. We'll talk about the flood in just a moment. Hello, friends. Welcome to Open Line with Dr. Michael Radelnik. This is Moody Radio's Bible study across America. My name is Michael Radelnik. I am the professor of Jewish studies and Bible at Moody Bible Institute, also the academic dean at Moody Bible Institute. And I'm so glad to be sitting around the radio kitchen table with you, taking your questions about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life. If you have a question and you'd like to call, our phone number is 877-548-3675. People say to me, I can't get through. Well, I'm going to give you the trick. Here's the insight at the beginning of the hour. That's the time to call, and that's when you can get through, 877-548-3675. Karen Hendren is sitting in for the vacationing Trisha McMillan. I'm glad you're here, Karen. Uh, She's our producer today. Handling all things technical is Chris Seagard. Tiara's answering the phones. Time for you to do something. Go get yourself a cup of coffee. Get out your Bible. It's time to talk about the flood. Well, Skeptics love to mock the story of Noah and the flood, particularly the animals being brought onto the ark. How could Noah have possibly fit all those creatures on one small boat? How was he able to feed them? What about all that waste? Although the Bible actually does treat the story as true, in not just in the book of Genesis, but throughout the whole of Scripture it's referred to, skeptics view it as a fairy tale. But the story is true. And here's how it could have happened. Three kinds of animals are mentioned as being brought on the ark uh, in the Bible. Birds, land vertebrates in the Hebrew, that's the word behemah, and creeping things. Uh, The Hebrew word remes can mean a number of things, but likely it refers here to reptiles. Uh, This wouldn't include sea creatures, fish, water animals which could survive a flood without the ark. Moreover, this wouldn't include every species of animal, only an animal's genus. With these limitations, Noah would need only to have brought mm, 16,000 animals on board, somewhere around there. People presume incorrectly that every animal was an adult, and they decide that they would not have fit on the ark. But more likely... Noah would have brought baby animals aboard. And if that's so, then some have conjectured only 11% of the baby animals would have been larger than a sheep. Only 11%. And the average size of a baby animal would have been about the size of a miniature Yorkshire Terrier. Still, would the ark have been large enough even for those small animals? The ark measured 30 by 50 by 30 cubits, according to Genesis 6.15. That's about 459 by 75 by 44 feet. So if you calculate the volume of it, it was 1.54 million, 1.54 million cubic feet. To put this in perspective, that's the equivalent of about 522 standard American railroad stock cars. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, That can hold, those stock cars could hold Uh, Each one could hold 240 sheep and therefore a total of 125,280 sheep. This would be more than enough space to hold the 16,000 animals that Noah would bring aboard. Still, people wonder about the practicalities of caring for those animals for 374 days. There's still some simple and reasonable ways they could have been cared for. For food, likely Noah brought compressed foods or grains. It's also possible that many animals might have entered a state of hibernation, limiting the amount of food required. Sufficient water was like water was gathered. There was a lot of rain, so they probably had a lot of rain barrels, and and they uh, they got enough water that way from the rain. The floor of the ark would have been built on a slope, so it made for easy washing away of refuse. These are just some simple possibilities show 
to show that the story of Noah and the Ark wasn't a fairy tale, but it was an actual true event. Uh, there's some other reasons I believe the flood is a true story. Jesus talked about it as a fact. If the Lord Jesus thinks it's true, I'm going to go with his opinion more than the skeptics. And here's another thing. If you look at across the world from the Sumerian flood narratives to Native Americans, indigenous peoples, everyone has a flood narrative. Everyone has a flood legend. Now, I don't think they got them from the Bible. I think they got them from the actual event, and then they were corrupted, and the Bible is the only accurate record. But isn't it amazing that across the entire world there uh, are indigenous peoples and all sorts of peoples from New Zealand to the United States of America to South America? It doesn't matter. They all have flood stories. But Talking about the historicity of the flood misses the actual point of what the Bible is teaching. The purpose of the flood was to teach God's grace in the midst of judgment. That's what's crucial to remember, God's grace in the midst of judgment. Now, here's why I say that about God's grace in the midst of judgment. If you read the first few chapters of Genesis, you've got the first couple who sin, they're expelled from the garden, judgment. The first murderer, he is ordered to wander the earth. That's his judgment. The first civilization is sinful, so it's destroyed by flood. The first great city, Babylon, is scattered by changing languages. And yet, in each of those circumstances, God shows grace. The first couple is promised the woman's seed who would crush the head of the serpent, God's grace in the midst of judgment. The first murderer is given a mark on his head to keep him safe from others. The first civilization, we've got Noah and his family being saved. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. The first great city uh, ends with them being scattered, but the very next chapter, God pulls Abraham out of Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees, and brings him to the promised land and gives him the great promises of the Bible. In every case, in these early chapters, you see God's grace in the midst of judgment. Now, uh, the story of the flood has a very s- specific literary style. It's called chiasm. It's a te- technique that shows a sequence of events leading up to the flood, and then it repeats them in reverse order as the flood dissipates. And so it's deliberate. It's a very key, uh, de- deliberate literary structure. And the purpose of that thing called chiasm is to find the center point. And the center point is different. It doesn't, it's not repeated. It stands alone. And that's Genesis 8.1. But God remembered Noah. Right in the middle of the whole thing, God remembers Noah and delivers Noah and his family. The point of this is God's grace in the midst of judgment. John 12.31 says, now judgment is on this world. Uh, in John 3.17 <clears throat> it says God did not send his son into, into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. See, we're still in the midst of judgment. In fact, there's a greater judgment that is yet to come. But the Lord Jesus is God's full expression of God's grace in the midst of judgment. If we know him and we trusted that he died for our sins and was raised again, We've been delivered from a far greater judgment than the flood, far greater than Noah. And now is the time. If you've never experienced God's grace, if you've never understood that the Messiah died for your sins and rose again, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, now is the time to experience God's grace in the midst of judgment by trusting in the Lord Jesus, and we will be spared a judgment even greater than the flood. Well, uh, that, my friends, is uh, a great reminder for us. And uh, I wanted to mention something before we go to the phones. We have a terrific offer, a a terrific resource this month. Uh, It's written by a a favorite professor of mine from graduate school, Dr. Charles Ryrie. You may know him from the Ryrie Study Bible. And it deals with a book that a lot of people have a hard time understanding. There's so many unusual events. It's a really important transitional book from the Gospels right into the epistles. And that's the book of Acts. People struggle with it. And 
We are offering the Everyday Bible Commentary on Acts by Dr. Charles Ryrie. And uh, that's something that I think you would, you would really enjoy. Uh, it's very helpful, and it's yours if you give a gift of any size to Open Line. We want to say thank you by sending you that book, The Everyday Bible Commentary on Acts by Charles Ryrie. If you'd like to give a gift, call 888-644-7122 or go to openlineradio.org, and there's the link, and you can uh, remember, ask for The Everyday Bible Commentary on Acts by Dr. Charles Ryrie. Uh, we're going to talk with Joe in Indianapolis, listening to WGNR. Welcome to Open Line, Joe. How can I help you today? Thank you. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I've been speaking to a friend about faith alone in Christ alone, and we've actually, she doesn't believe that, but mm-hmm. she, you know, she believes in Jesus' death and resurrection is for your, you know, Mm -hmm. remission of your sins. We've been through the book of Galatians slowly and half of Ephesians, and I just thought, do you have something to recommend? Maybe there's a verse. She would like it to say, if you add to faith, you are not saved. (laughs) And I don't think it's in there. (laughs) Uh, Well, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says, uh, I'm sure you went over that verse with her, didn't you? Yes. Uh, Yes. By grace you're saved through faith. It's not of works. That's not adding anything to it. Uh, you know, there we right. go. Uh, and then uh, another good verse that you might want to show her, but, you know, it's not going to say it. It's going to explain it, just like uh, that's an explanation of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But uh, Titus 3, 5, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It's not according to works of righteousness that we had done. Nothing added to it, only by God's mercy. So Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 deal with God's grace, which is giving us something we don't deserve, and God's mercy is in Titus 3, 5. That's not giving us what we do deserve, which is judgment. That's... uh, that's what the that's the best verses that I can come up with. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Pray I for the Lord to, to sure. open her heart to that. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, right. I once was uh, I was dealing with a contractor and talking with him every day. He'd finish working on my deck and he'd come in my house and he would sit at the counter and we'd drink iced tea and chat. And one day I asked him how he would know his sins are forgiven if he ever stood before God, and he said, "Well, I try to be a good person." I Go to, and he talked about the church tradition he was in and all that. And then I said, hey, let me show you something. And I showed him Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And I said, by grace through faith, not grace through works or sacraments or any such thing, just by grace through faith. And he looked at me and he says, that's what I believe. I said, since when? He says, since now. Uh, and that's when he trusted the Lord. So just keep going back at it. Keep talking to her about that. Okay, Joe? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're going to take a break here, come back with more of your questions in just a moment. This is Open Line with Michael Rydelnik. Call 877-548-3675 with your question about the Bible, God, or the spiritual life. We're going to come right back and talk with you about what you're wondering about in the Scriptures. Stay right there. Welcome back to Open Line. I'm Michael Ray I I have to say one of my favorite people, one of my real partners in Moody Radio is here with us as our engineer today, Chris Seagard. Uh, Chris and Heather, his wife, just two of my favorite people. And they partner with Eva and I when we do Israel trips with Moody. And uh, Chris and Heather will be going with us to the GNC in September. when We do the Moody Journeys of Paul tour. Uh, the reason... I just love working with Chris is he's just such a great team member. He, they film, they do audio. We send clips back to the radio stations here in the United States. It's, we just have such a great time working together because he's such a great worker. He is, he, and his wife, they do such a great job. She does photographs and it's just amazing the work they do. And 
we have a fun time, a lot of laughter while we have that great time together. Uh, and, you know, that, that's how life is, I think, on Moody Radio. People don't realize that, but we really do have a team here. You, you know how much I love Trisha and uh, how much I love the people that I work with all the time. It's, it, it's just a, a wonderful team effort. And I especially appreciate everyone listening. You're part of the team, too. And there are some of you who are special partners with the team. You've become kitchen table partners. And what you do is you give monthly every month so that we can keep open line on the air every week. And we so appreciate it. Uh, we're, we up to, we're up to 750, <laughs> it's amazing to me, 750 kitchen table partners. And we would sure love it if you would consider becoming one. My goal for this year is, is to get us, uh, get a team together of a thousand kitchen table partners. That's what I'd really love to see by the end of December, by December 31st, 2024. So uh, if you'd consider it, one of the things that we do for you is every other week we send you a Bible study moment. It's an audio Bible study. Uh, and what that does is you click on it, you get to listen to about an eight or 10 minute Bible study, uh, an audio Bible study. Another thing, uh, for those of you who commit to $30 a month or more, you get 50% off everything in the Moody Publishers catalog, including the Moody Bible Commentary and the Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy and lots of books like that. So uh, I just really would appreciate it if you'd consider it, and thank you if you have done it, and really grateful for all of you who are really part of the program in this way. If you'd like to become a Kitchen Table Partner, call 888-644-7122 or go to openlineradio.org. And we're going to talk with Maria, listening in Missouri, I'm guessing on the Moody Radio app? Yes, I am. Yeah. Actually, well, it's on the radio. Ah, cool. It's, yeah. I well, was listen, let's turn if... down your radio a little bit, okay? Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I can hear myself in the background. It's not fun. <laughs> I don't want yeah, everyone I to hear myself my... on the radio. <laughs> I do that when my cell phone echoes, and it's very annoying. <laughs> I have a question for you with all of the hate that's been going uh, on towards Israel and all of the protests that are here in the United States, and there's so much hate for the evil people, the Jewish nation, Israel. Alleged Jewish people, alleged uh, evil people. They're not, Jewish people are not intrinsically more evil than anyone else. We're we're all sinners, but that's not. We are. Jewish people are are, uh, my beloved people, you know. Uh, Are you Jewish? Yeah, I'm Jewish. Uh, but, you know, all, okay. sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But this idea of demonizing Jewish people as being worse than all others, intrinsically evil, it is uh, just, just horrific. Uh, anyway, what's your question? Do you think that all of the hate that has been directed towards Israel and the Jews lately, do you think that that is a prophecy in the Bible, and do you think it's a prophecy that could be being fulfilled right now? Mm. I mean, there's just so much hate and evil and wickedness everywhere in the world. I mean, the Bible says that we will never, not even the angels in heaven, and yeah, well, only God knows when he'll okay. come back. And yeah. I mean, okay, really know okay, Marie, uh, let, let's see if I can focus on this question. First of all, uh, anti-Semitism or the hatred of the Jewish people. That's what anti-Semitism means. It's not the hatred of people who speak Semitic languages. It means hatred of the Jewish people. Wilhelm Marr started that term, coined it, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, He was uh, the founder of a political party in Germany called the Anti-Semitic League. And the reason he chose that term is because he was looking for a way of uh, expressing Jew hatred that sounded more scientific and less mean. So he uh, he came up with anti-Semitism. It was based on an alleged race that Jewish people were distinctly part of. I think it's falsehood. There's no such thing as a Semitic race, but that's what he based it on, false theories of the 19th century. And uh, it basically taught that Jews were biologically malicious and wicked and more evil than any other and more dangerous than any other people on earth. Uh, That's what all anti-Semitism is. It's a conspiracy theory that sees Jewish people uh, in this uh, very hateful way. The big difference, I would say, it's always been with us, 
uh, the big change in the new anti-Semitism is it used to be directed against Jewish people all over. Today, it's more focused on the Jewish state, the Jewish land, the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, that's what it seems like to me is the big difference. Uh, although it, it's not limited. I mean, people hate Jewish people all over the world, but it's really focused on Israel as being somehow the most malevolent nation on earth. Um, and used to be that in Europe, they would say, uh, and around the world, you Jews, you can't live in our land. And now it says, Jews, you can't even live in your land. Uh, that's That's the big difference. Now, what do I see in terms of prophecy? I don't think this is anything new, but you do see a movement against the state of Israel, for example, in the United Nations, in the EU, in different places like that. Uh, And it does say in Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 that at the end of days, at the end of the tribulation, all nations will gather against Jerusalem. And so a lot of people would say, oh, we've lived in the last 50 years and there is, uh, since World War II, there's been a real negation of anti-Semitism and it's just a matter of time. Uh, really, anti-Semitism stayed alive in Europe, in the Arab world as well, but it was pretty much minimized here in the United States. However, now it's exploding in the United States as well. So wh- what are we going to do about this? I think believers, those of us who are followers of Jesus, need to be the loudest voices in opposing and doing everything we can to stop this. And one of the things that we've done is we've called a summit right here at Moody Bible Institute. It's on November 9th, 2024. Keep looking in the next couple of weeks. We're going to get a website up about it. But November 9th, 2024, all-day conference, a summit opposing anti-Semitism. I'll be speaking So will Dr. Mitch Glazer, president of Chosen People Ministries, our co-sponsor on this uh, summit. Also, uh, Dr. Don Sweeting, whose dad was the president of Moody when I was a student. Don and I went to college together. He's the chancellor of Colorado Christian University. We're going to have a number of speakers, uh, a breakout session led by one of our Chicago radio uh, hosts, uh, Carl Clausen. It's going to be an outstanding summit, which will really help us learn and motivate us uh, to do what we can to stand with God's chosen people and oppose this wicked hatred of the Jewish people. And it's not limited just to people in Chicago. You can come from all over, uh, just like any other conference that we have here at Moody. There's great hotels nearby, and it's, it's, it's before the big snow season begins. And so uh, it's a great time to come to Chicago, November 9th, 2024. Don't miss the Moody Summit Opposing Anti-Semitism. Thanks for your call, Maria. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to talk with Pauline in Illinois. Uh, welcome to Open Line, Pauline. How can we help you today? Hi, Dr. Rydelnik. It's Colleen. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for the um, kitchen table Bible study. And also, I wanted to let you know, whenever I hear your voice, I just feel encouraged and safe about whatever you're going to say. So oh, well, thank, thank you. you. You're so kind. Thank you. You're welcome. So here's the question. I don't have a lot of Bible background. I am a born-again Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel close to Jesus. And I'm starting to read the Old Testament, and I'm trying to understand God's character over time, and some things are happening in the Old Testament. Can I give you a couple examples? Mm -hmm. Okay. One is when these two angels come to Lot, and uh, they're like, hey, we want to rape those people who just came. And they're like, no, I have two virgin daughters that we'll give you. And another one is uh, the idea of stoning people. And so I'm trying to get my understanding of God's Mm -hmm. character? Well, uh, first of all, when Lot says, when he's trying to protect those angels from the, uh, the wild group of, of sexually aberrant people, and he says, take my two virgin daughters. I, I just can't believe he would do that. I, it is beyond I mean, Lot was, uh, what can I say? He was an idiot. And, you know, when you read in First Peter, righteous Lot, 
I think, righteous lot, it makes you really do believe in justification, Old and New Testament, because righteousness doesn't mean being made, uh, justification doesn't mean to be made righteous, it means to be declared righteous by faith. And so when uh, Lot's called righteous, it's not because he did everything right, it's because he did a lot of wrong things, Uh, but also... Uh, You know what, Pauline, when we come back, I'm going to keep talking with you, okay? Uh, Because we're in the midst of a break right now, and when we come back, we're going to have the mailbag, but first we'll talk with you a little bit more, Colleen, okay? So hang on, we're going to keep talking about this. This is Open Line with Michael Rydelnik. Michael Ray Delnick, and I was speaking with Colleen. She wants to know about the difference between how people deal with each other in the Old Testament, like stoning or righteous Lot giving his virgin daughters up to the crowd outside the door, which we don't know that he did, but that's that's what he offered, uh, and things like that. Do I have your question right, uh, Colleen? You do, and... Just to add one little bit more, yeah. so when Moses gives laws like, you know, go ahead and stone him, I was just wondering why he wouldn't just do the Jesus way. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so first of all, let's. Uh, I'm trying to talk about righteous Lot. Righteous Lot, what he did was not righteous. He was declared righteous by by faith, but not not by his behavior. Uh, the, so. Uh, I don't think using him as an example, that's not a, you know, when we read the scriptures, one of the things I say, we have to look for a sin to avoid or an example to follow. And that's a sin I would avoid what Lot did. So that's not, the Old Testament doesn't present him as commendable or someone that is exemplary. Okay. Uh, As for stoning, let's just talk about... uh, Achan, in, in Joshua chapter 8, remember he took the stuff he wasn't supposed to from Jericho, and uh, he was stoned with his family. Do you remember that? I don't know if you know that story in Joshua. No. No? Well, what I think is no. so interesting is there's a New Testament parallel. Now, uh, most people don't realize it, but there's the story in Acts 5 of Ananias and Sapphira, and one of the things that yeah. the author of Acts does that's the story where they lie about how much they're giving and they're they they're the word of knowledge Peter calls them out both times and then they both die instantly sheesh uh, and yeah. it it deliberately uses the very words that are used in the story of Achan except it, it it's using the words from the Greek translation of it's called the Septuagint. It uses the very words, and it's to show at the at the start of Israel there was a very serious consequence for uh, this kind of stealing of lying, and it's now to show at the birth of the church. There's also going to be you know don't don't take God lightly. This is, it's still serious. Uh, now I don't think anyone else that lied about their uh, funds and what they gave are struck down like that, but it's to show the pattern of taking gods seriously. The other thing is when Israel was going into the land, uh, stoning was probably much more like, for example, working on the Sabbath to distinguish them from the Canaanites and some of the practices that are involved with Canaanite worship, that they were carried out in a much more aggressive way, the way Moses describes it, uh, than in the New Testament, but then, of course, you've got Ananias and Sapphira. You've got people uh, who are struck uh, in the book of Acts in, <laughs> in ways that are just not normal, you know, in, in how we see things. Why is that? At the birth of things, at the beginning of things, these are much more common. Uh, it, it seems to me that there's no record in Judaism after the founding of, of the people of Israel and the land of Israel after the conquest, where anyone was stoned uh, for 
for adultery or for Sabbath breaking or anything like that. And in fact, that when you see later, when the prophets are calling people, to, uh, the prophets, I call them covenant enforcers, when uh, the Jewish people would break the, the law of Moses, the prophets would come and say, no, you've got to keep the law of Moses. But what they didn't say is you got to stone people. They didn't say that's the part you got to keep. They said you got to keep obedience to the law, but not that you should stone people that don't. It's kind of an interesting way that that adjusted. Uh, so uh, I understand your your question, but I do think that there's a serious treatment of sin in the New Testament as well. Uh, okay. And then on the other hand, uh, some of those things in the Old Testament that's kind of scary, it's either not exemplary, like, like uh, what Lot did, or not just is okay. it not exemplary, but they uh, they weren't carried long term, uh, just like everyone that lies isn't struck down by God. Uh, okay. 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 I, that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, by the way, there's a great book I'd recommend. Uh, uh, it's uh, toward and uh, toward Old Testament ethics. That's what it's called. Toward Old Testament ethics, written by Walter Kaiser, and it is a very very helpful book. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Rydelnik. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so grateful for your call. And joining me right now is Karen Hendren. She's joining me with the FEBC mailbag. Uh, thanks, Tricia, for putting the mailbag together. FEBC, thank you so much for partnering with us uh, to bring you the mailbag. Uh, FEBC, Far Eastern Broadcasting Company, is reaching the world through media and personal follow-up. If you'd like to know more about their great ministry, is go, all you have to do is go to their website, febc.org. Click on the link about their podcast until all I've heard. I think you're going to really, really appreciate this ministry. Hey, Karen, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad to be here, too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, sorry about delaying the mailbag, but we'll, we'll get more mailbag next we'll hour. We'll get more next hour, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's 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 important to get these questions answered fully, right? Yeah, yeah. do the best I can with yep. that. Yep. yep. All right, well, I'll just jump in then. Yep. Uh, Amy uh, listens in on Facebook, and she wrote in, and she said, karma isn't biblical, but what is a good response if someone believes it? Well, you know, first of all, a lot of people talk about karma, and they don't really believe in it. Uh, you know, uh, you know, they might say, "Oh, the, uh, the I was I'm cleaning the attic, and the work karma was good today, you know, and I was able to get a lot done." And they, they're just using it in a sort of a, a generic kind of uh, uh, cultural way, you right? Know. Just an expression. Yeah. Uh, then people who actually believe in karma, like. Uh, John Lennon, instant karma is going to get you. I think he's the one that did that song. Uh, you know, that, that's based on uh, Eastern religion and, you know, it, and even things that are based on, not based on the Bible, mm -hmm. there's an element of truth. Yeah, yeah, You know, sure. what, what goes around comes around. Yeah. Or what the Bible says, that whatever, whatever a man sows, that he that's will also reap. reap. Yes, that's the kind of form of what people mean by karma. And so rather than uh, if I was talking with someone and they were telling me about how they just believe in universal karma, I would say, well, you know what? There's a link to the truth when you talk about karma. I'm not sure I'm going to live my life in fear of karma. But what I am going to do is point out what the book of Galatians says that whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And and then explain that principle of sowing and reaping. Mm -hmm. uh, God is not mocked, it's, is what Galatians says, uh, that, that God will hold people accountable and then use that as an opportunity. Yeah, it's an opportunity to point people to, to dig in, yeah. right? How, how to break karma uh -huh. <laughs> is yeah. by trusting in Jesus. That's how we do it. Because what we have sown is sin. What we will reap is judgment. But if we trust in Jesus, then we can break that cycle and God will forgive us. Now, there may be some consequences for our sins regardless. Sure. But the, the punishment from that sin can be broken away. That's how I would deal with it. Okay. All right. I like that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, Kimberly uh 
wrote in. She listens in uh, in South Carolina. She wants to know how beneficial or necessary is it to have a study Bible in which study Bibles or translations do you think are best? And she's also wondering what you think of the new Tree of Life version Bible. Let me just say the Tree of Life version is a Messianic Jewish version. Most of the translators were Messianic Jewish scholars. Uh, It's a good translation. I like the the layout because it uses the uh, order of the Hebrew Bible, not the Septuagint, which is our Old Testament is based on the Septuagint, the Greek translation but they actually use the order of law, prophets, and writings that we have in the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And so I appreciate that. Uh, There's a lot of good in the translation. There'll be words that you'll be surprised about mm, if you you read it, but I think people can understand it. I think it's a really good translation. Mm -hmm. Uh, In terms of a study Bible, does someone really need a study Bible? No. I think people need a Bible. (laughs) <laughs> and the the damaging effects, if there could be one of a study Bible, is people tend to read the notes rather than the text of Scripture. Right, right. So uh, for my daily reader, I do not use a study Bible. I just use a Bible. Right. And I actually, I'm, I'm one that I don't even want a, a red letter. Uh, you know, I don't, I think the whole Bible's inspired. I don't, I don't want to distinguish the, the red letter words of Jesus, you know, as if they are more important than what the rest of the Bible says. They're, they're all the Bible. So they're all God's word. So that's me. On the other hand, I do have, I have multiple study Bibles because when I read the Bible, I have questions. And when I want something quick, uh, right. I right. will grab a study Bible. And some people use one all the time. I have a friend who reads the Bible and he ignores the notes, but when he has a question, he looks at, it, he uses the Moody Ryrie Study Bible by Charles Ryrie. It's a great study Bible. It doesn't, it doesn't overwhelm you with notes. Uh, my wife has one that she would never carry with her all the time, but she has by her desk. She uses it all the time, the ESV Study Bible. The notes are terrific and thorough, but it's so thorough, it's, it's like carrying around the Moody Bible commentary with you. So uh, I tend to keep the Moody Bible commentary near my my area where I'm reading, so I grab that if I have a question. But the ESV Study Bible is very helpful. Uh, The Holman uh, CSB Mm -hmm. Study Bible, I actually helped write that one. I was on the translation team and the the study team. So I did the notes on Daniel in the Holman uh, CSB or Christian uh, Standard Bible Study Bible. Uh, That's a that's a really good one too. You know, I. What am I going to say? Are they? <laughs> they're worthwhile, uh, but the problem would be is to become so dependent on the notes that we don't read the text. Right. So better to get a Bible to read the text and then have a study Bible there to grab and look up if you have a question. So make sure you get to the text first. Yeah, always. <laughs> get always. to the text first. Yeah, that's what I think is is the best way of dealing with it. Well, thank you for bringing those questions in. We'll have more questions. Absolutely. Next hour when you come back, that's Karen Hendren. My name is Michael Rajelnik. And uh, this is the Bible Q&A portion. What you can do is go to openlineradio.org and click on Ask Michael a Question. Send your question in that way. We'll be right back with more of your calls in just a moment. So stay with us. Welcome back to Open Lines. So glad to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, The attack on Israel on October 7th and the resulting war with Hamas has prompted all sorts of questions, even today, about Bible prophecy. You know, people get caught up in the internet speculation and doomsday prognostications and date setting and all this kind of stuff. That's not the place to look. What we need to do, the real place, is to find out about the future from the Word of God. And that's why Chosen People Ministries is offering a terrific Moody Publishers book for free. It's called, What Does the Bible Say About the Future? 30 Questions on Bible Prophecy, Israel, and the End Times. It was written by Land of the Book host and prophecy expert and former provost here 
at Moody Bible Institute and my friend Charlie Dyer. It's a great book, and it will really help you understand what the Bible says about the future, which is true and relevant and really helpful. So uh, how do you get it? Just uh, go to openlineradio.org, scroll down until you see a link that says a free gift from Chosen People Ministries. That's it, a free gift from Chosen People Ministries. Click on that, and you'll be taken to a page where you can sign up for your own free copy of What Does the Bible Say? about the future. And thank you, Chosen People Ministries, for offering that. Uh, We're going to talk with Ginny, listening in Chicago on WMBI. Welcome to Open Line, Ginny. How can I help you? Yes, I have a question about uh, Matthew 24. Okay. uh, The part where it says, um, uh, two will be working at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Two will be working in the field, one will be taken, the other left. I've heard it preached different ways, and I want to know what your thinking is about it. Yeah, some people argue for that as a post-trib rapture because they're reading the passage completely. You know, there's the tribulation, and then two will be taken and so forth, right? Yeah, and so, I've heard it that way, and then I've heard uh, that it would be the rapture. You know, they'll be taken in the rapture. Yeah, the, there are some I, people who I, believe in a, a post-trib rapture because of that. Then other people who are pre-trib say that they're being taken away to judgment at the end of the tribulation. But all of that is reading Matthew 24 as if it's in direct chronological order. But I don't think that's what it is. Do you have your Bible? I hope you do. Let me show you what I think is happening Uh, In my opening word today, I talked about chiasm, and what we have in Matthew 24 is a chiasm. In uh, verse 3, we have two questions asked of the Lord Jesus. Tell us, when will these things happen? That's question A. And then B, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the first question is when, and then question Question A, when? Question B, signed. What is the sign? Okay. Now notice, Mm -hmm. when Jesus replies to them, he begins by answering the question about signs. So he goes to B. So question A, question B, answer B, then answer A. So he begins by talking about the signs of the end. And that's what he's talking about all through from verse 4 to verse 35. And then in verse 36, he picks up question A, which is the question of when. And what he talks about is no one knows when it's going to come suddenly and unexpectedly. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. That's the rapture. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Because he's saying when? No one knows when. The rapture is imminent. It could happen at any moment. And when will it happen? Well, it's unknown, and it'll be sudden. One will be taken. One will be left behind. So I do think it's referring to the rapture, but we have to read it as a chiasm. A, what are the signs? B, when will it happen? B is answered. I'm sorry. When will it happen? A is when will it happen? B is what are the signs, and then the Lord Jesus answers B, what the signs are, and then he answers A, when it will happen, no one knows, then the rapture. Okay, Ginny? Yes. Um, that, that, that helps a lot, I've I think. Of it, but I've heard it both ways, and I just thought I would ask. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not trying to say mine is the right way, but uh, let me just say, when I— <laughs> There, I was turned on to this interpretation by a professor I had in seminary. He pointed it out, but I didn't see it expanded. Then a professor here at Moody, John Hart, wrote a couple of articles about it, uh, and he convinced me completely. And then when Mike Van Lanningham, my partner on the Moody Bible Commentary, he did the commentary on Matthew, and he didn't hold that view. And I said to him, because I had to edit it, I sent it back to him. I said, read these articles by our colleague, John Hart, who was also writing the Moody Commentary, but he was doing other books, uh, and uh, see what you think. And Michael was so convinced. That's that's the view. What I just presented, the ABBA, is what's in the Moody Bible Commentary. So 
uh, since Michael agrees with me, I think I'm right. Okay. Uh, now, he, okay. now, thank you for your call, Janie. Now, here's the thing. I, 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 I want to just say this. I think that the timing of the rapture is something that people argue about. Some people say there is no rapture. Of course there is. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 is a great description of the rapture. Uh, the great snatch, we could call it. That's what the Greek word means. Uh, there is a rapture. Some people say it's before, some say it's in the middle of the tribulation, some people say it's at the end of the tribulation. Listen, stop arguing about the rapture. That's, I just don't think it's important enough. What is important is that Jesus said, I won't leave his orphans, but he will return for us. So what we need to do, I mean, I, I'm convinced of the pre-trib rapture, but what we need to do is remember that Jesus is, the Lord Jesus really will return. He really will fulfill every prophecy. We will be delivered. Israel will be delivered uh, at the end of the tribulation, the beginning, I think before the tribulation, the church will be removed and then tribulation comes and then after that, Israel will be delivered. So uh, it is it is important to understand what we're talking about with the rapture. It's not something to argue about, but it is a great reminder to keep looking for the Lord Jesus. We don't know the day or the hour, but he will come. Well, can you believe it? That's the first hour. Thanks for listening, everyone. Keep listening. There's a second hour of Open Line coming up on most of these stations. If your station doesn't carry it, check out the Moody Radio app or get the podcast or listen online. During the break, check out our webpage, openlineradio.org. It's got all the links you're looking for there. Second hour of Open Line is coming up straight ahead with more of your questions, so stay with us. Open Line with Dr. Michael Rydelnik is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. We'll be right back 